perfume called Jungle Gardenia. And it, you know, it could light up the whole building. It was worn by none other than Diana Ross, <laughs> who was a tomboy and very masculine in presentation. Many people don't know that. But if you get an opportunity, um, you can see uh, a video on YouTube where the Supremes are at uh, a French uh, a French theater called La Car, C-A- R R E, and there's they do one of their songs and Diana Russ, all right, yeah, all right, man. I mean, and 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 she's very hard. It's hard to believe that's the same one. That is very aggressive. They they got a couple of people. It was called International Talent Management. Uh, it was called uh, I T M I. And I forget what it's, it's international uh, talent management something or something. And that was the group that said, hey, look, we're going to clean up and fix up all of these young people that are from Detroit and other places. And so we can showcase them where they can perform before a television audience or you can send them to a sophisticated uh, venue or supper club or a cinema uh, on a concert where they where nobody can deny that these people are good because a lot of times people will buy a record but they wouldn't go to a concert to see you right and and there's a lot of money if you know how to book things if you have a good act that draws that's part of the money in the business mm -hmm. in fact the, the concert tours help fuel the sale of records and other things so maxine powell had a charm school where she would teach people male and female how to eat how to speak how to dress how to sit how to present yourself as world-class men and women mm. in fact diana ross was such a hard case until barry gordy had someone even above mrs powell to work with diana ross for months to to train her out of her project ways people need to remember that all of these families that a lot of these people came from were struggling families. These were not wealthy black families where people could afford all of that. The, these folks came from average families, sometimes uh, where you didn't have the kind of, of, of training, you know, and it may seem foreign to certain people, but I remember being in uh, junior high school and we, in our French class, went to a French restaurant on Wisconsin Avenue here in D.C. And there were people tripping off the fact that I was eating with a knife and fork. In fact, certain people accused me of being arrogant and trying to show off. These are black people. I, I, I'm still shocked. I mean, I, I, I wasn't trying to be special or look down on anyone as you know but some you know not everybody has books in their homes not everybody has silverware or china in their homes not everybody not everybody gets the newspaper N n a lot of people don't we can't assume what you have in your household everybody else has you can't assume that everybody reads or the right. Some people, you know, you'd have to go to their house to see, you know, have you ever been to someone's house? They had no furniture. They had no couch, whatever. <laughs> Some people don't have that. They, they, they're not exposed. You can't afford that. If you're trying to move millions of records, if you're trying to get on national television. And in fact, you'll find that, the success of Motown uh, had a lot to do with Maxine Powell and the others. And not just Maxine Powell, but we need to mention that um, Charlie Atkins and there were also vocal coaches and other people that really worked with the young people. But in particular, uh, Maxine Powell 
And so you won't see any clips on television of Motown at Centaur. 65. Remember, the company starts in 59. You won't see many video images of them until 64. Sit down and think about that. You, you won't see Mary Wells had a string of top 10 records. There's not a lot of television exposure for Mary Wells. There's not a lot of video when you sit down and think about it. Not, not prior to 64. And the reason I believe some of that is not just the racism of the time, the limited options, but they were working on polishing up and fixing up. So when they did unleash these Motown uh, acts, that they would immediately be recognized as being polished, poised, professional as well. They could sing, they could dance, and they did it in a tactful, professional, yet soulful way that was identifiable people could predictably expect if you go to see a motown group they they can they're gonna look good they're gonna sing good they're gonna move good what that meant in particular for maxine powell and most people are are, are not don't have an idea of how impactful her work was, but yet you look at Diana Ross, who's 79, will turn 80 next year. These women were feminine. Black women, prior to the 60s, when you see them, they're maids with the bandana on the head. You know, you don't see black women being feminine or attractive in nice clothing. Go back and look at the, the images of our black women are not very laudatory. Mm. That, that changed. Maxine Powell, what, what she did with Diana Ross and Martha and the Vandellas, uh, what they did with Brenda Holloway, black women, and um, emphasize black women, although she worked with them in too, the image of the Supremes and all the other groups changed how people look at black people, in particular black women. Um, everybody talks about the album Thriller, and it's a great album. It's a great album. But many people fail to recognize that in 1964, when Motown dropped where did I love go as an album that thing sold five, six million copies or more worldwide. If you sold five or 6 million now, that's really good. I think you know that mm -hmm. that's insane for a group of young black women to be in competition with the Beatles who have all the whiteness and everything behind that. And you have three black young women in nice clothing. And whereas they didn't always put the faces of black people on the covers of their albums, they always did that for the Supremes. And their albums always sold. So uh, Where Did I Love Go, released at the height of the British Invasion, was the third best-selling album of 1965. That's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? And, and yet Billboard will say it never went to number one. How do you outsell almost everybody else and you don't go to number one? Beware of white people and their numbers and how they estimate things. And I, again, I want to say that the cultural impact of Maxine Powell who also trained Gladys Knight, who still can sing, and everyone loves Gladys Knight as the Empress of Soul. So that's Gladys Knight, that's Diana Ross. Two major black women uh, artists, performers, 
that have international significance and importance. And no one can say that Gladys Knight isn't beautiful, radiant, gifted, talented, has a lot more voice than Diana Ross, but Diana Ross does her own thing. Both women really did a lot for the image of black women and black people. I, mm -hmm. So not only did it lift the image, but it changed what people expected. All kinds of opportunities to perform. People began to at least, there were more opportunities for all the other black artists, even from other record companies to get television exposure and to get bookings because this idea and this image of black elegance, black chic, black femininity, or should I say also an urbane black style. It's very different from the ratchet people that we see in this, uh, this uh, bombed out depleted dick hop. That's what I call it, Dick Hop. It's filthy. <laughs> Con contrast this this red thing to the Supremes or to Gladys Knight or to Brenda Holloway, a less known, or for that matter, Kim Weston. If you were to take these images of, of black women, they were gorgeous. They were desirable. They literally flipped the idea of what a black woman was on its head to the point where royal heads of state, whether they're in Europe or in Japan, wanted to know these young people from Detroit. At the height of civil rights discrimination and so forth, these images made it very difficult for certain people to justify stereotyping and dismissing. Can you imagine how you carry yourself, how you present yourself, even when someone's a bigoted monster? Someone's going to say, you know, I kind of like, I really like the way that these people look. I know I'm not supposed to like them. I mean, you know, that's part of what happened in the music business and the record that white children were told they couldn't have black music they liked it so much they would have it hidden in the house same way people hide weed and they hide their pipes and all they're going to do people had this stuff because they couldn't they couldn't ignore it and to this day this image of uh black urban sophistication both masculine and feminine has made an impact when you see the K-pop and you see all these Backstreet Boys, all of these people are imitating this glamour, this image created by Maxine Powell, Charlie Atkins, and the other people at the Motown Hit Factory. Mm. It, it has shaped, and the only people who have thrown that in the trash are our stupid asses. We're the only people that have never figured out that the most successful American vocal group 50 years on are the Supremes. And it's, it's, I mean, and, 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 and they rate, I think the same way in Canada. And I think that they're still doing well, we don't even, or the temptations we can look at this stuff is still selling their records are still going platinum decades after they were cut but it's not just the music it's also the image they're well dressed they know how to speak they know how to walk all of this is important if you look around in our communities you see how the way people walk it's abysmal the way people carry or present mm -hmm. themselves it's it is the opposite of what people were fighting to say we're dignified people. We're beautiful people. We're proud people. We're sophisticated people. We have class. We have beauty. Maxine, Maxine Powell wanted that projected. And so we may come from a rough diamond, but we'll be polished into something that everyone would like 
to behold or to be, uh, how can I say, uh, surrounded by. Part of what made black music, in fact, they didn't start throwing huge contracts out to black performers until Motown in particular. They threw a, a half million dollar contract at Mary Wells. They offered a million dollar contract to the Supremes. Like in 65, this is when they start seeing these million dollar contracts because even the big white major companies start saying, wow, what could we do with this? In fact, when the first people to get one of those big multi a million dollar contracts with Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone, which recorded with Epic to compete with Motown, these folks made a niche. Maxine Powell and these other folks of Charlie Atkins and others coaching along with the Funk Brothers and the producers like um, Norman Whitfield and, uh, and Barrett Strong, who just passed not too long ago, um, and, and Holland Dozier Holland and Smokey Robinson and Ronnie White and all the others who were making the music uh, behind them. But it's this image. So when you think of Motown, in fact, there's another person, um, Suzanne DePass, who who carried on what Maxine Powell did, but she did it with the Jackson 5. So when you see the early Jackson 5 things, someone groomed and prepared them for national television to do the tours, to look how to hold a microphone. Um, so, and Suzanne DePass is still alive. Phenomenal lady. And uh, of course, work with a lot of people. A lot of what we feel good about, that's someone's work. And a lot of times it's a black woman with the eye for the beautiful to bring a sparkle or to shine or to make something special. This is what our great women have done Likewise, akin to Maxine Powell, right next to her is uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs, born in 1879, if I'm correct, in Virginia. And she moved to Washington, D.C. And she organized what was called the National Training School for Girls here in Washington, D.C. to teach black women business skills, industrial arts skills, so black women could be ladies not lured into prostitution or limited to domestic work, to teach them how to have their own businesses, to teach them how to, to dress, how to look, how to conduct themselves. Nanny Helen Burroughs, uh, who was one of the most powerful black women in the country, most people don't know about her, she was the essence of femininity, sophistication, and yet she was a major force, a major political force. She would speak before the Republican national conventions, speaking out against lynching, speaking on behalf of money for black causes. And look at her in the clothes she had on. What a regal black woman. What an incredible black woman who was a, a kind person that helped people, but she was tough as nails. She would stand up to the no good nigger preachers here in DC. I swear to you, this is true. And before I ever started saying Coon Buster, she has a speech I have to send it to you where one of her speeches, which is chloroform your leaders. In other words, she said, knock those niggas out and take what's yours. She talked about trashy, no good black leadership that's a hundred years ago i think the speech is from 1923 so a lot of people consider me radical no i've studied my ancestors i'm doing exactly what i saw one of these elders do i'm doing the exact same thing i have nothing new 